most uh, most um, people uh, in North American uh, uh, English high school English classes first encounter the haiku as a um, as a poem with five syllables in the first line, seven sy syllables in the second line, and five syllables in the third line. And uh, that uh, definition of the haiku is actually something that's been hotly debated in the last few decades because, um, and I'm not a by any means uh, an expert on the subject, but the normally, my understanding is that normally what is counted are kanji. Um, and so there would be five characters or kanji in the first line, seven in the next five. And, and but the, uh, the um, analogy between the kanji and, and syllables is, is seen as kind of a fraught and not very accurate analogy. So um, the five, seven, five syllable haiku is almost its own form. Um, but I, uh, and in some ways it's, it's kind of a hybrid of, um, of Japanese poetics and a, sort of a North American take on that, uh, on that poetic tradition. But um, I thought it would be interesting to look at these poems, this sequence by Rachel Wetson, uh, because it's a wonderful example of what's called syllabic verse. And I mentioned syllabic verse in passing, I think last week or the week before. And syllabic verse is, um, it's sort of a step towards uh, accentual syllabic meter, normally just referred to in the English language tradition as meter. Um, uh, and in fact, syllabic verse is in a meter. It's in, what, it's in a syllabic meter. So syllables are being counted, but stresses are not. Um, so in this case, we have, uh, three line stanzas, five syllables, seven syllables, and then five syllables again in each stanza. Blue Octavo Haiku by Rachel Wetson, after Kafka. In fat armchairs sat indolence and impatience, plotting my downfall. A wicked cage flew across the long horizon, searching for a bird. I burned with love in empty rooms. I sternly turned knives within myself. Behold the bright gate, the keeper said. I am now going to shut it. Hardly was the road swept clean when, ah, there appeared new piles of dry leaves. But nothing could kill a faith like a guillotine, as heavy as light. Happiness, finding your indestructible core, leaving it alone. Into the heavens flew a breathless legion of impossible crows. So if you were to characterize the effect of these, um, of these stanzas being haiku, and again, just just for you personally, what what difference do you think it makes that there are five seven five? Well, how does it? In what way? What does it affect um, the poem for you, if at all? Would it make a difference if these were nine? If these were say, if there were nine syllables uh, in each of the three lines, or would it make a difference if there were a variable number of syllables, if no syllables weren't being counted at all? The form is compared to meter, it's almost inaudible, isn't it? I mean, it's not, you can't, if someone were, if you were to read this aloud, um, people wouldn't, it seems to me unlikely that anyone would know, I mean, barring the title, of course, that anyone would know that these were haiku or that there were a specific number of syllables in each stanza. So it's, um, it's kind of got this um, naturalism to it, the uh, syllabic meter, it, you, you are counting something and it's definitely guiding your hand it, to the extent that it's just like all the other formal constraints that we've talked about. It's determining your word choices and it invites this subtle comparison between the stanzas and it gives us the impression that they're all, that uh, each of them is, um, exists in a necessary relationship to the others.
but you don't hear it. Joanne, I think, asked me about um, uh, in how one can incorporate writing from another another poet into one's own work or what the procedure, what the sort of stylistic procedure for that is or the convention around it. Um, interestingly, there are some quotes and paraphrases of Kafka within this poem. Oh. So behold the bright gate, the keeper said, I am going to shut it. Uh, I think that uh, <laughs> it's been a while, but I believe that's before the law, I think. Uh, oh. uh, and then uh, I, believe as well a wicked cage flew across the long horizon searching for a bird is a paraphrase also of Kafka though I've uh I've forgotten the specifically which uh which piece is being quoted um but notice that that phrase up at the top after Kafka uh acknowledges the debt and so it's um, right yeah and I love what you said Laura about these about the sort of unlikely pairing of Kafka and haiku. And uh, in putting those two things together, um, I think Wetson allows herself to sort of free herself. She, she sort of frees herself from some of the baggage that, uh, and associations that might surround uh, both haiku and Kafka, right? Um, I mean, if we, um, if, if we knew that the poems were haiku, we would bring a certain set of assumptions as to what they would be about. We might think, for example, they would be about the changing of the seasons, or we might think that it would be an appreciation of Japanese literary culture, or we might think that if we, we knew it were just about Kafka, we might think that we, we might have, um, we might feel that it's gonna be about, about um, sort of uh, inscrutable and malicious bureaucracies, um, but, in bringing the haiku and Kafka together, we don't quite, we, we still have all of those associations, but they seem to come from such opposite registers that we don't really know where we're, where the poem's gonna go. Um, let's, let's just keep moving ahead here because uh, time is short, but I wanna look at the song of Wandering Angus by Yeats. Um, and uh, I've mentioned again, meter, a few times, and this poem is in meter. This poem is in accentual syllabic meter. It's got um, four iams per line, which means that there are, um, uh, in other words, there are eight syllables in each line, I believe, <laughs> unless there are any uh, irregular ones, which there may be. Um, but, um, uh, but in principle, every line has um, eight syllables with stresses on the second, fourth, sixth and eighth syllables. Um, and um, uh, then the unstressed syllables would be the first, third, fifth, and seventh syllables. And um, just as um, you all were observing about the um, how the haiku invites us to compare lines to one another, um, in the uh, in this poem, the accentual syllabic meter also invites us to compare the lines to one another, uh, except this time we're, we're also conscious of the lines as units of sound. Um, and you'll hear it uh, when, uh, if we, when we listen to the poem, you'll actually hear the, you'll hear what's being counted, not only the syllables, but the rising and falling stress. Um, an interesting thing to know about, about uh, accentual syllabic stress is that in uh, English language poetry, it's relative. So that's not true, for example, in um, classical uh, Greek and Roman poetry, you have um, what's, what's being counted as uh, the duration of syllables. You have long syllables and short syllables, and it's possible to have a line in which there are, say, eight long syllables in a row. Um, not so in, in English language metrical poetry because you can't, it's not meaningful to speak of eight syllables in a row all being stressed. Something can only be stressed relative to the syllables around it. So therefore, uh, the, the meter isn't counting anything absolute. There's no such thing as a stress, a word that's always stressed or a word that's never stressed. Um, 
all that there are, are is, is a rising and falling rhythm. Um, and it, it can lift up on, on a preposition. It can, it can even, it's rare, but it can even, a stress can even fall on the word the. Um, uh, so it's just a question of where words are stressed relative to the ones around them. And you'll notice that if um, a word that you might think would normally and naturally take a stress, like I say, an adjective or a verb, a word that has a lot of dramatic weight, if it's put into an unstressed position, in other words, let's say you've got, uh, uh, there's a line by Theodore Recchi that goes, uh, the whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy. Well, small boy dizzy. Uh, small and boy and the first syllable of dizzy can't all be stressed. So uh, boy gets subordinated to small and to the first syllable of dizzy. And it, but it creates this moment that you can hear in the line, the whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy. You hear that pop, pop, pop of those three stresses in a row because the boy doesn't really want to be in an unstressed position. And likewise, when you have words that don't seem as if they would naturally take a stress, but they're being put in a position where the meter sort of insists that a stress should fall on them, you experience this moment of the, the, the poet can actually make the rhythm convey a sense of uncertainty or hesitation or anticlimax. I'm covering a lot here, I know, and I'm speeding through a lot of things, and it's just because we have only an hour, but um, if you want a fuller treatment of this, there's a wonderful, wonderful book, which I use all the time when I'm teaching uh, graduate students in the writing seminars, and it's um, All the Funds and How You Say a Thing by Timothy Steele, and it's really the best treatment I know of meter. Um, it's really excellent, and I'm, again, a the, what were the things I'm talking about here? I <laughs> ideally I would spend you know several classes talking about these things, so I'm just giving you a pricey. But um, uh, listen for those things as we as you hear this poem. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll do this one uh, just because I want to make sure that those that you really that the rhythm comes across as clearly as possible. So most metrical most prosody up until uh, the early 20th century would have said that the job of meter is to record what we hear. Um, and so they would have said small boy dizzy should all be marked, three stresses. Um, and then the tendency probably in the last hundred years has been to um, take the view that because um, because it's what we hear is sort of nebulous and uh, what we hear is actually kind of a combination of the abstract metrical scheme and then the natural rhythm of the words that to actually try to get into parsing where the stresses fall um, is sort of presenting something that's actually quite ambiguous and subjective as if it were objective. So instead, the meter, the tendency these days is to mark the metrical, you know, what's kind of indisputably, <laughs> or as close to meter can be indisputably the case where the stresses fall. And there are still what are called metrical substitutions, where you say, okay, this, you know, the, the baseline of this poem is iambic, but in this first foot, there's a trochee, which is a stressed filled syllable, followed by an unstressed syllable. But people tend to just mark those sort of variations that are clear and uh, sort of indisputable. And they tend to operate on the principle that the line must always have the appropriate number of stresses. Um, and never, so a line of pentameter should never have, a, so which is to say five, five IMs. A line of iambic pentameter would be five IMs. The line of iambic pentameter should never contain four stresses and should never a scansion of it should never show four or six stresses, though it might show the inversion of a metrical foot or it might show an anapest where an iam would be. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And Timothy Steele, again, all the funds and how you say a thing, he makes a very passionate argument on this subject. <laughs> so uh, you, you, if you really want to get into the weeds, he, he, he covers it in great depth and detail. The Song of Wandering Angus by William Butler Yeats. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut 
and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame, but something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair, who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Let's see, a line where the stresses are really, let's, let's find one where the, um, they're quite unambiguous. Um, so the second line of that second stanza, I went to blow the fire aflame. So our stresses are falling on went, blow, fire, and flame. That's a, you know, that's it's hard, would be hard to read that line as anything but iambic tetrameter, four tetra for four, four iams in a row. Again, the stresses on the even numbered syllables. But then it's a little more complicated when we look at a line like, uh, let's see, uh, and moth-like stars were flickering out. Um, so we um, notice that moth-like stars, that's a little bit like the small boy dizzy. That like doesn't, it, the likes, it seems like we want to, we really want, some part of us wants to go stress, 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 moth-like stars. Um, and then flickering, um, we, flickering is three syllables, right? Uh, stress on the first syllable, sure, but then you've got unstress, unstress, and then out. Um, and so that would be what's uh, that would be what's called an elision, where the the um, uh, you pronounce it as if it were flick ring. <laughs> the second syllable gets dropped, and in the uh, you, I'm sure you've all you've all seen poems in which there are little uh, apostrophes standing for missing syllables. That that was the custom in the 19th century, and poets uh, still do that. Still, they still allied all the time but they tend not to mark it uh, with apostrophes, but they do, it's still, it's absolutely still um, counted as a, as a missing syllable. Um, age and aging, I mean, it, it is a preoccupation that, uh, that Yeats had throughout his literary career, I would say. I mean, even when as a young man, he wrote poems like When You Were Old, <laughs> which, right. uh, which, uh, and it, um, and then he returns to it when he is, in fact, older in poems like Sailing to Byzantium. Um, uh, I feel that, I mean, it seems to me that, I mean, both to the question of the poem's themes, but also, again, in relationship to the meter, um, there's a very interesting moment in the first line of that third stanza. Do you remember me saying that with a line seems as if it doesn't, if it seems as if it doesn't really want to conform to the meter, uh, if it seems like syllables are getting elevated by the metrical scheme uh, into positions where we're sort of asked to read them as having a stress when they normally wouldn't, that we experience that as a moment of anticlimax. Look at what's happening with wandering in that, at the end of that, first line of the third stanza. So first of all, um, he's already alighted several times in the poem. So he's, we, we could easily just, we could easily uh, read wandering as wand ring. But in this case, that's not what we're being asked to do. Our eight stresses, our eight syllables um, mean that the stresses, if we're, if we read this as a line of iambic tetrameter. Our stresses are going to fall on I and old, and the first syllable of wandering. So far, so good. 
but then we've got to have we've got to read wandering as stress unstress stress so not only is it the whole word being drawn out it's not being elided into wandering uh in the way that say brightening is getting elided into brightening um and, but also we've got to read a stress as being on that last syllable which you wouldn't normally I mean, wandering if you look the word if you were to look the word up in a dictionary it would say it's a three syllable word with one stress on that first syllable and now listen to it if i read those four the, that line with say the three lines preceding it with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air though i am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands do you hear it do you hear what happens on that last syllable of wandering you hear your ear registers the absence of that natural stress and it's uh, you can you could say i am old with wandering uh maybe and yates probably would i <laughs> uh, had a very declamatory formal uh style um of presenting his poems but uh though i am old with wandering no matter even if we say it that way you can hear that that last syllable doesn't really want to take a stress um and so it creates this moment of rhythmical anticlimax and that that actually is at the very moment when the when the speaker is expressing the sense of exhaustion and depletion uh, and so the the uh in answer to Laura's, or in response to what Laura was saying about Yeats's gift with meter, it's that the meter isn't being banged down onto the, as a, it's not being, you know, banged down like a cookie cutter onto the, onto the message of the poem. It's actually working with the message of the poem, just like, just very, just like uh, the other constraints that we've looked at, the anaphora, the assonance, uh, that the, that the formal structure is uh, actually complementing what's being said. Okay, great. All right, let's have a look at uh, what lips my lips have kissed and where and why. What lips my lips have kissed and where and why by Edna St. Vincent Millay. What lips my lips have kissed and where and why I have forgotten, and what arms have lain under my head till morning. But the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply, and in my heart there stirs a quiet pain for unremembered lads that not again will turn to me at midnight with a cry. Thus in the winter stands the lonely tree nor knows what birds have vanished one by one, yet knows its boughs more silent than before. I cannot say what loves have come and gone. I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that in me sings no more. I love this poem. I find this just a heartbreaking poem. Um, um, So this poem is in iambic pentameter. Um, it's just, it's like Yeats's poem, it's iambic, but you'll see that there are five iams being counted in each line. Um, look at the effect um, of those enjambments. So an enjambment, again, is a moment when the, when the end of the line does not correspond with the end of a sentence. Um, so the first line is not enjammed. What lips my lips have kissed and where and why I have forgotten. Uh, but then look what happens after this, after, after that first line, I, I have forgotten and what arms have lain under my head till morning. But the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply. So notice that we, that that second line, uh, the phrase in the second line just rides right over from the second line into the third. And then in the, th the third line down into the fourth, again, um, 
What arms have lain under my head till morning, but the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply. Look at how gentle that rhyme is between lane and rain. It's just, it's almost inaudible, which is extraordinary. Um, it's, a, it's a rhyming couplet in, a, um, in iambic pentameter. And yet we might hear those four lines and not even know that we were hearing a rhyme. And that's because of those two very artful uses of enjambment. And look at how she's setting up hard moments of punctuation elsewhere that actually are more noticeable. Uh, they're creating quite noticeable pauses that are not corresponding with the rhyme. So like I have forgotten, comma. Um, that's what's called a caesura, C-A-E-S-U-R-A. A caesura is a pause or a stop within the line. Um, and Caesar is an enjambment or kind of go hand in hand in a metrical poem because they create hard pauses that then allow the rhyme to be a gentle rhyme, allow the rhyme to be subtle because the rhyme's not getting hammered home with a period or a comma following it at the end of every line. And look at how, uh, again, to this idea of the form kind of dovetailing with the meaning. Look at how, look at the effect of that pause after reply. She doesn't enjam in that fifth line and look at how it is so beautifully mimetic of what she's describing. There's this quiet scene in those first few lines, but then they tap and there's this pause while it's as if they're listening for a reply. What lips my lips have kissed and where and why I have forgotten, and what arms have lain under my head till morning, but the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply. So you can hear that sigh reply rhyme very clearly, much more clearly than the lane and rain, and it's apt, it's the right choice at that moment because we're getting these ghosts tap, 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 tap on the window listening for a response. Uh, this poem is a sonnet, and it's, it's a particular kind of sonnet. It's called a, a Petrarchan sonnet, or sometimes known as an Italian sonnet. And the, the rhymes actually, that, so the first eight lines are what's called an octave, uh, and then this, the second stanza is what's known as the sestet for eight and six. And look at how the rhymes kind of organically hold those units together. So we, in the first, in that first eight lines, the rhyme is, we have Y rhymes with Psi, Lane and Rain rhyme with each other. And then look at this, Reply and Cry also rhyme with Y and Psi and Pain and Again rhyme with Lane and Rain. So we've got just those two sounds, I and Ain, running together through that whole first eight lines. But then in the next, in the six lines, we have tree rhymes with me, one rhymes with gone, sort of, uh, and before rhymes with more. And so you've got a, a just a different little nest of rhymes. And it's, um, uh, it, there's a, you can feel the poem turn from that eighth line down into the ninth mm -hmm. and look at how the turn corresponds perfectly with the change in the speaker's thoughts because we have this image of her being in her room, the rain being full of ghosts, them knocking, knocking at the window. Um, and then we have this wonderful conceit that this metaphor that closes out the poem in which she compares herself to a tree uh, and all of her, the sort of implication of the metaphor is that all of her lovers are like the birds who've flown away from the branches of the tree. She can't remember what their names were. She can't remember who they were. She only knows that they've gone and the music has gone with them and the summer has gone. Yes, and Malay, you know, just had, I mean, by the standards of the time and probably by the standards of any time, she just had an extraordinarily unconventional life and a scandalous life. Um, um, she, uh, 
I mean, one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite uh, facts about Malay is that she um, this uh, her husband Eugene proposed marriage to her three times, and she turned him down the first two times. Um, and then on the third time, she said, "Okay." but only on the condition that I get everything I want and everything I need for my poetry without, without reservation. Um, and, and he agreed to that. He agreed to that on those terms. And um, uh, at one point she moved him out of the master bedroom and moved a young man into the master bedroom and, and Eugene's uh, stayed in another room down the hall. Uh, and um, uh but she was a celebrity in a way that's hard to imagine for a poet these days. She sold out the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, she gave a huge, just barnstormed around the country giving poetry readings and Eugene traveled mm -hmm. with her and was... Uh, um, all right, well, let's, we have time for one more poem. Let's, and it's, it's a, this is a heartbreaker. Um, this poem is by James Merrill, uh, Christmas Tree. Uh, and I wanted to show you this as an example of a poem that is not metered, but James Merrill wrote, had a, wrote many poems in meter, and you can hear this sort of formal sensibility running through this poem as an undercurrent, even though the poem uh, is not, does not have a formal scheme that I can detect. Um, and uh, the poem, uh, as you, many of you know, may know, Merrill died of AIDS-related complications. Um, and so the poem is, for me, the poem just sits beautifully between this double meaning the whole way through of the uh, speaker dying in a hospice. And this was one of the very last poems that Merrill wrote. Um, and But it's also, of course, about a Christmas tree, uh, a Christmas tree at, after Christmas. Christmas tree by James Merrill. To be brought down at last from the cold, sighing mountain, where I and the others had been fed, looked after, kept still, meant I knew, of course I knew, that it would be only a matter of weeks, that there was nothing more to do. Warmly they took me in, made much of me. The point from the start was to keep my spirits up, I could assent to that. For honestly, it did help to be wound in jewels, to send their colors flashing forth from vents in the deep, fragrant sables that cloaked me head to foot. Over me then they wove a spell of shining, purple and silver chains, eaves dripping tinsel, amulets, milagros, software of silver, a heart, a little girl, a Model T, two staring eyes. Then angels, trumpets, Bud and Bee, the children's names, in clown-like capitals. Somewhere a music box whose tiny song played and replayed, I ended before long by loving. And in shadow behind me, a primitive IV to keep the show going. Yes, yes, what lay ahead was clear the stripping, the cold street, my chemicals plowed back into the earth for lives to come. No doubt a blessing, a harvest, but one that doesn't bear now or ever dwelling upon. To have grown so thin, needles and bone, the little boy's hands meeting about my spine, the mother's voice holding up wonderfully. No dread no bitterness, the end beginning. Today's dusk room aglow for the last time with candlelight, faces love lit, gifts underfoot, still to be so poised, so receptive, still to recall, to praise. What an extraordinary thing, I think. I always, I, it's, I mean, it's some, writing a poem in the shape of something is something that that children do i mean it's not something that is it's it's often seen as uh naive 
by by many professional poets and editors. I mean, I, I don't mean to suggest that it is. I, I think it's, I don't, I think you can do anything actually in a poem, but it's something that you, there aren't too many poems, is what's known as a concrete poem. That that's where a poem is in the shape of what it represents. Um, but Merrill, it's kind of cheeky of for a, a, a poet of Merrill's stature to do that and then to do it as one of his last poems. Um, I don't know, it kind of breaks my heart. Uh, I mean, to have this childlike, simple form to a Christmas poem about a Christmas tree in the shape of a Christmas tree. Um, I just find it almost inexpressibly sad. I guess it, what I mean to say is it makes me, I mean, the poem is about, we have the children, the, the children are in the poem and they're, it's sort of the, the poem, the idea of the children at Christmas time. Um, but um, Merrill, you know, Merrill was, knew that he was facing his death here. So it, it reading those lines about the, um, the little boy's hands meeting about my spine. It's the little boy holding the Christmas tree, but it's also, I feel like it's almost Merrill imagining him, himself as a little boy holding on to himself as an old man or as, a, or as an invalid. But Donna, I take your point. There is a lot of joy in the poem too. And that's, there's the beautiful paradox, I think that the, I mean, that's, the poem does end, doesn't it? With, uh, I mean, this is the final vision of the poem. Uh, the, uh, the end beginning, today's dusk room aglow for the last time with candlelight, faces love lit, gifts underfoot, still to be so poised, so receptive still to recall, to praise. I mean, that's where it ends us, right? With love and praise and recollection. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's again, it's the, the image of the Christmas tree is carried through right to the end, but it's also himself, right? That he's saying that even now in this last hour that he still is poised and receptive and is still able to recall, you know, to remember and to praise, no bitterness, he says, still, still praise. <laughs>